All right, uh, today's sermon is entitled uh, Part 1 of What Does Jesus Want Me to Do? What does Jesus want me to do? Uh, we can think of that uh, collectively as a church, what does Jesus want us to do? But each of us individually, here's this character out of history, lived about 2,000 years ago, what does he want you to do? Jesus is one of the most important people in the entire history of the human race. As a Christian who believes that he is God incarnate, that God in heaven saw our situation, saw the tears, saw the bloodshed, saw all the broken friendships and, and pain, and he came down to do something about it. I believe, obviously, he's the most important person in history. But let's, let's set that aside for a moment, set the theology aside. Just Jesus, the teacher, the philosopher, the theologian, uh, even if you don't believe he's God incarnate, Jesus is one of the most important people in the entire history of the human race. Even if you don't believe he's God incarnate, it's still impossible to deny that the course of human history, entire nations would not exist. Western culture as we know it would not exist, would be astoundingly redirected uh, if not for this one man's life. The world today wouldn't even remotely look the way it does if Jesus hadn't walked around the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Without television, without satellites, way back there, one guy impacted the way the world thinks and perceives and, and human rights and all these other things and in the direction of entire countries was altered. So the question I have today is, pretty big guy, what does Jesus want us to do? What, what would this philosopher, theologian, teacher, and if you believe he's God, what does God want us to do? That's a big question for a lot of us. Uh, what, what does God want me to do? What, how should I use my life? What am I supposed to do with my life? How can my life have more meaning than it does? Because it feels like I'm just going through a grind. Day after day, same thing. Life has got to be more than getting up in the morning, brushing my teeth, going to work, coming home, taking a shower, and going to sleep, and then repeat, press, repeat, press, repeat. Wow, I look back, I've been doing this 10 years already. Press, repeat. 20 years, time for retirement. What? Press, repeat. Life has got to be more than that. What would Jesus want me to do? This is a, a really good question for anybody. But again, if you say, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christ follower. You know that this morning, the vast majority of people who say they follow Jesus are, uh, are in bed right now. You know, Jesus died, and before he went to the cross, he said, I want my, my family to be unified. He talked about establishing the church. He died. The church is called the Bride of Christ. Jesus loves his bride. And somehow, in American culture, we think it's okay to say, yeah, I follow Jesus. <laughs> don't like his bride. She sucks. Uh, you know, I, I follow Jesus. I don't want to be at church. How is that? that? We're having a disconnect. We're loving him, but not loving the things that he loves. So, if... I say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to ask myself, what does he want me to do right here this morning? And today is just part, part one of that. We're going to look at that for a couple weeks now going forward. What does Jesus want me to do? What was important to him? That's a good clue. You know, sometimes when you're growing up, mom and dad didn't give you a specific rule but you kind of knew your parents' heart, what they allow, what they don't allow, the things that they're into, the things that they don't really uh, smile upon. What was important to Jesus? What did Jesus do? Well, he went to the cross. Why did he do that? Love. I think that's the answer, right? Love. He loved other people who treated him badly because he wanted them to be part of his family and forgive and he was giving himself for other people. Wow. Wow. And then he wants us to be like him. 
Who is Jesus? What is he about? What does he expect me to do? To answer these questions, the Apostle Matthew writes a record of the life of Christ. And, and you're thinking back in that first century. It, it may be within 20 years of, of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It could be even earlier. We don't know. But Matthew sits down and, and he writes this out. Or maybe Matthew spoke it. And there's a debate. Was the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, originally written in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, and there's this really cool theory, and there's no way we can know. So he's living in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, and his name was Matthew, and he, he decided what we really need is a first-hand witness. So he's writing this down, and again, if you know anything about the, the New Testament, you know that Mark and Matthew, the, most of the book of Mark is found inside Matthew, and of course Mark wasn't an apostle. So either one of two things happened, right? Because Mark is actually the oldest fragment we have. We have it to very close to the time of Christ. We have a part of a fragment of Mark. So a lot of scholars think that Mark wrote first, and then Matthew says, a, short, version, a, good... a condensed version to be able to, to give out to new believers or new Christians or to have in churches. To, so maybe they took Matthew and reduced it to have a short, quick version. And some of the very early Christians report that Mark Although he was not an apostle, he was like the scribe for Peter. And so it could have been just as easily called the Gospel of Peter because Mark was very possibly the one writing it down from research and from conversations he had with, with Peter. Uh, and that's what some of the very first early Christians tell us. So Matthew uh, writes down this record of Jesus Christ and copies of it are made. And what they did was they would take... Uh, things written by John, things written by Paul, things written by Matthew, and they'd make copies. They'd sit down and make a copy, these, make a these copy. books, and they'd have all the, all the New Testament writings because at that time, remember, they only had the Old Testament. So as these books are being written, they're collecting them together. So I want you to imagine that you're, you're, you're in a New Testament church, a first-generation church. You're the first Christian in your family, and your church is the first church in this community. And Last night, the book of Matthew comes, and your pastors were up all last night reading it. And, and they sent out the word, gathered together. We're going to get together in the morning early, and we're going to read it together. And we remember we talked about how in synagogues and in the early churches. Together, and there is incredible excitement because for the very first time, you're going to hear the reading uh, from this firsthand account by the apostle Matthew. And so here you are in church, or, or sometimes you'd be gathering in a grove or down by the river, so you're worshiping in the most beautiful cathedral of all, which is nature. As the sun's rising, you're all gathered together. But anyways, you're, you're with your Christian brothers and sisters, so that means it's church. So you gather together, and imagine now, you're, again, you're one of those first century Christians, and you're being blessed. They open it up. You're excited. This man lived with Jesus. You've heard about Jesus. Now, what is it going to say? What is the book of Matthew going to tell us? You're ready, you're primed, you're eager. A man would have stood up and he would begin reading the newly arrived document. And right away, the book of Matthew starts off with the genealogy of Christ. It's going to tell us how Christ fits into this Old Testament. How Christ fits into the Old Testament plan. Here, here's God's plan weaving throughout history. And now, right now in our generation, remember we're first century Christians, right now, Christ has come. And he died for our sins and he rose again and we're going to be able to hear about this. And you hear the miraculous circumstances of Christ's birth. This is no ordinary child. You listen as the Holy Spirit is introduced. Uh, you can see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but not like you can in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is revealed to us in a brand new way. You learn that the Messiah was given the name Jesus and Jesus meant he would save his people from their sins. So you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. The things I've said, the things I've done, the things that go on in my mind, the way I treat people, I'm messed up and I'm broken. And a Savior came from heaven for people like me. And so his name is Jesus. He's going to save us from ourselves. 
save us from our sins. And then you'd hear this prophecy that Jesus would be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us. And you realize this is already happening because in your church you gather together and you worship Jesus. He is Emmanuel. You worship him as God with us. We recognize that it was God incarnate. God himself. God did not sit in heaven and say to some prophet or some angel, oh, I really love these people. They're broken. They're going through a hard time. But I love them so much. Go down there and die for them. God himself came, incarnated himself, put on flesh, set aside his glory, and came down and suffered for us. And this is the greatest example of love, and nobody else gets that glory but God. This is the greatest example of humility, and nobody else gets that glory but God. Only God has the greatest love story and humbles himself in this way for people who don't have the time of day, who get tired, who get bored, who are too busy, who spit on him, and he comes down and he suffers for people like you and me. God made flesh, God who leaves paradise to save people like you and me from our messed up nastiness. He gets right down there in the gutter, in the muck where we live. This is a revolutionary thought. Throughout the world, in every culture, human beings are taught to serve God, serve the gods. Uh, and we too, as Christians, were taught in this book that we're to obey God. But there's something different also going on in this book. We're called to serve a God that first came down and served us. And that's why this is supposed to be different than anything else in the world. Jesus says in the world, those with authority abuse you. In the church, brothers and sisters, we're not supposed to be pulling this big deal thing. We're not supposed to be getting offended easily. We're supposed to be loving one another and serving one another. And the example we have is the greatest one of all. We're spit on, abused, ignored. And he still loved us. And he suffered for us. Remember before Christ went to the cross, he washed his disciples' feet because he says, human beings, you guys don't get it. You're all so full of pride. I want to show you what this really looks like. It's about humbling ourselves and loving each other. God in the form of a servant. You guys, right now, are not doing the imagination thing very well. Zeus, Apollo, Thor, Odin, all these gods that's, that a suppressed and oppressed humanity in, in, in these popular mythologies. And suddenly we're talking about a god who comes down and acts like a servant? The reason this is not blowing us away is because we grew up hearing it. Put yourself back in the first century. What is going on here? This is radical. It's revolutionary. It's unlike anything else. Willing to suffer. Face scorn and rejection. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. And as you listen, as the scroll's being read, as the book's being read, you fall in love with Jesus once again. Matthew goes on to contrast the humble Savior with the self-centered King Herod. And we fast forward a couple decades and Matthew introduces the famous figure of John the Baptist, a man who held the attention of an entire nation. And Christ said there's nobody ever been born greater than John the Baptist. And yet, John the Baptist is marked by deep humility and he's willing to step out of the spotlight and say, put the spotlight on Jesus. He must increase I must decrease, and he fades away, and Jesus Christ takes center stage. Yet, when Christ comes to John, Christ allows the prophet to baptize him. That's kind of strange. And, and John the Baptist says, no, 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 I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. I can't, I can't do this, and Christ says, no, it's good for us to accomplish all righteousness. I need to establish a pattern of obedience for those who will follow after me. I'm going to identify myself because I'm God 
come alongside humanity. I'm going to do what my children do. I'm going to identify myself with my children. God is a man coming alongside broken humanity. Again, Emmanuel, God with us. Again, amazing, amazing humility on his part. Then Matthew records this amazing scene where Christ is tempted by a wicked spirit named Satan. When Christ had been fasting many days and he was hungry and tired, Satan tried to challenge him and to twist scripture and create an excuse for Jesus' sin. Could I have everybody stand up at this point? Thank you. Uh, I have a very deep spiritual meaning for asking you to stand. I saw a few people fading on me. Uh, Uh, Satan tried to provide an excuse for Jesus to sin. Because a lot of times, we're not going to, let's just be honest, we're not going to say, oh, there's something really wicked and disgusting and depraved. I'm going to really stab this person in the back. I'm going to gossip about him. We don't, we don't, we, we sometimes do, because we're messed up. But we don't usually go into a situation saying, I'm going to really mess this up. I'm going to be really nasty. What do we usually do? Okay, you can be sad. You can be sad. What, what do we usually do? We usually find an excuse for it. We, what do we tell ourselves? Well, I'm not gossiping, but I think people need to know about this. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, I've got a bad attitude, but it's because of her, you know. We, we make excuses for ourselves. And so you see Satan not saying, Jesus, do something nasty. What he's doing is saying, Jesus, he's, he's even using scripture and twisting it, using it out of context to try to get Jesus to do something he shouldn't. We, we look for that cover too. Some reason to give in to temptation in a way that we can tell ourselves, well, we're really not that bad. Uh, sure, I'm bitter, but that person just pushed too far. <laughs> I'm a reasonable person. I would not be acting this way if it not for them. Isn't that what we tell ourselves? As if that gives us the right to act nasty. I know I'm being selfish, but these people never do anything for me. So therefore, I can be self-centered. No. See, the devil is trying to give you cover, give you an excuse, so you can run away from God as fast as you can. I wouldn't be pouting if people were more considerate, but they're not, so I can pout. No, no. I, I know all these from firsthand experience, you know. I can do these things. I'm actually pretty good at doing these things, uh, unfortunately. See, there's always a reason, and, and Jeff always reminds me of this. I once said in a sermon last year, a creative person can always find a reason not to be in church on Sunday morning. And Jeff is, keeps quoting that back to me. Uh, a creative person can always find an excuse for sin. You don't have to be that smart. Yeah, I'm doing this, but... I'm doing this because, as if it makes it okay. Jesus, the creator, the most creative of all by definition, had options before him and he chose not to sin. Satan tempted Jesus by appealing to his stomach. Uh, Jesus was a guy. He appealed to his stomach uh, while simultaneously challenging Jesus as God. He says, prove it uh, by doing something supernatural. Make these stones in, into bread. Jesus tried to get Jesus to test God by taking unreasonable risks, doing whatever he felt like and then expecting God to pick, clean up the pieces. Just jump off this cliff. God will, God will prop you up. And finally, Satan tempted Jesus to avoid pain, avoid tears, and avoid hardship. That's the way most of our prayer life looks like. God, I really don't want to hurt. God, I'm just afraid of pain. God, I really uh, I can't stand to be depressed. Save me, you know. I want, to, I want the easy way, to take the easy way out, to take the shortcut. Give me everything I want and make it easy. And the devil said, all you got to do is worship me. I'll give you everything. The devil says, you can be popular. I'll give you all the nations of the world. You can be popular. All you have to do is join the other kids when they gossip. You notice that? That you go to a new workplace, you go to a new school, one of the easiest ways to get in is to find out who everybody is talking bad about and also talk bad about them. Then everybody will accept you. Talk bad about the boss. It's the way, it's like a social lubricant. Of course, it's from the pit of hell. 
If you love Jesus, you're not going to be joining in on that. The Bible talks about murder, adultery, and gossip. He puts it right up there with the things that destroy the world that God wants to create. But if you want to be popular, just bow down to Satan. He'll show you a way. He'll help you. You can have more money. All you have to do is, is work Sundays and stop giving to church. Have you ever thought, boy, that new appliance, I could buy that if I just stopped giving to church. PlayStation 4 is coming out. I don't, maybe just skip a week or two. I could have that. So, so easy. When we make God our money, when we bow down to God, then all, when we make, when we bow down to money, the Bible says that money can be like adultery, uh, can be like idolatry. When we bow down to money, suddenly bowing to God doesn't make much sense. We bow down to God and we see how foolish and ridiculous it is, ridiculous it is to bow down to money. You can have any person you want. You're a guy, you know. You can have anybody you want. All you have to do is break your marriage vows. You know, Satan keeps spinning these lies. You can do whatever you want. All you have to do is bow down to me. You can grow your business. Just fudge the numbers a little bit. Everybody does it. Your competitors are, are really uh, promising more than their product can deliver. The only way you can grow your business is if you do the same. Bow down to Satan just a little bit. You can allow yourself revenge, whether you like it hot or whether you like it a dish served cold. Revenge. Get back. Nobody pushes me around. I'm gonna. All you have to do is give in to your dark feelings and turn your back on the God who died for you. That's all. Easy. And Satan made it easy for Satan. Satan made it easy for Jesus. Jesus came to suffer and die to draw people to him. Satan says, I'll give them to you. All you have to do is do things my way. Bow down to me. And Jesus said, and Jesus said get out of here. Leave me. Jesus faced all these temptations and more without giving in. And in the end, Satan is running. And while this story is being read in that first century congregation, everybody, everybody in that church realized two things. One, the Apostle Matthew has given us a blueprint for how to trust God and overcome the lies of temptation because every time Satan misused Scripture, Jesus quoted Scripture to contradict that. And we can know that in our lives, uh, we need to fill up our hearts and our minds with this book. That's why we encourage everybody in our church to, to get after this book. Read it at home, not just on Sunday mornings. Be a Bible reader. This is a Bible church. And so we, de we defeat temptation in our lives by having Scripture fill up our hearts. Because we're going to fill up our heart with something, either the lies of the world or the, or the truth of Scripture. But you know what? Let's be real. I was talking to a, a young man recently. He was talking to me, how do you overcome temptation, sexual temptation? How do you overcome lust? And so I listed all these things that are very necessary for us to do that are right there in Scripture. That's a different message. We can get into it another time. But then I told him, you know what? I've confessed to my church before that there are things in my heart, there are attitudes that I'm going to struggle with for the rest of my life. And I want to struggle with those because I don't want to give in to them. I'm not going to say I'm a guy, it's okay. But I want to be really honest with you. I want to be very straightforward with you. And everybody in that church, when they heard how Jesus whooped Satan's butt, they're all thinking about times when I treated my mom so badly. Boy, I sold that guy some stuff and there was not as much there as I told him there was. I have a problem with lying. I have a problem with lust. I have a problem with greed. Everybody in that church realized that Jesus was something special, something different, that he succeeded where oftentimes we fall short. This powerful truth. He succeeded where we have failed. Jesus is not just another teacher. He could take the devil's worst and send him packing. And I'm sure... Their love for Christ increased all the more when they heard it. 
Look at the God we worship. Look at the Savior we worship. He doesn't give in to pettiness. He doesn't hold grudges. He's not bitter. He resists all temptation. In this book, the only perfect person is Jesus Christ. There's no perfect church. There's no perfect Christians. And there's no perfect pastors. And we glorify God when we confess our weakness and saying, He's good, and I want to be more like Him. My life falls short, but I never want to start, stop striving for the life that he offers us. So what comes next? Well, let's, let's turn together now to Matthew chapter 4. We'll read 12 through 17. So John the Baptist just got tossed in jail. When Jesus heard that John had been uh, put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, and Capernaum is going to be his new base. That's where he's going to be for most of the New Testament. Uh, it was in a different political region than Jerusalem, so the people in Jerusalem couldn't go and grab him so easily. And that's where he did a lot of his miracles in that region. That's where he did a lot of his preaching, uh, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. These were two Old Testament tribes of Israel. And when it says in the area, it's probably where the two tribes, their borderlands came together. So he's living in, in that region. Uh, in the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So there's a lot of non-Jewish people living here. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. We spend a lot of time talking about this at Christmas time, so I'm going to move quickly. But again, this is a dark world. This is a brutal world. Before Christ came, might makes right. You live your life to acquire more, more slaves, more wealth, more power. And into this, where the generation after generation of young couples loving each other, having kids, and dying, and loving and having kids, and dying, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And all these tears, and all this heartache. And everybody prays, God spare me, God spare me. And everybody who's ever prayed that from, let's say, 128 years and back, just to be safe, in case there's really some old folks out there, they've all died. Now, almost everybody prays that prayer, but they've all died. This is a world of death. It's a world of sickness. It's a world of pain. It's a world of heartache. Every love story ends in tears unless you go in a car crash instantly and both of you go at the same time. Every love story ends in tears. In a people living in darkness and weighed down and heavy by their own messed up hearts, it's not only that the people around me are, are abusive, I'm so sick of myself and the way I can treat people and the things that go through my mind. And, and in the middle of this darkness, a light has died. From heaven, coming down, God loves you, God cares, God is real, and he's coming to do something about this sin, this sin-sick world. He's some, coming to do something about our pain. He's coming to do something about death. He's going to have victory over it all. A people living in darkness have seen a great light. That's Jesus Christ. Those living in the land of the shadow of death. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach what? Repent! For the kingdom of heaven has come near. God came down to be with us, and what's his message? He says, repent. Children, you're going the wrong way. Wrong values, wrong priorities. You're living for the wrong things. The way you treat each other, no, no, no. I had something better. And then he shows us what it's like to be a servant. And he says, repent. You notice Jesus didn't say, Jesus didn't say, hey, uh, guys, uh, just believe in me. And, and you can be happy, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Jesus was very bold. He said, turn around. Stop going that direction. He's talking like a parent. Repent. Change. Here's how one writer defined, listen to this, this is a great definition of repentance. Repent means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. In the Bible, to repent means sorrow from wrongdoing, but most must also include 
that you stop going the wrong direction and start doing what God says is right. Repentance always involves making a change away from sin and towards God. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful definition? Let me read that again quickly. Repent means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. In the Bible, to repent means sorrow for wrongdoing, but must, also, but must include that you stop doing wrong action and start doing what God says is right. Repentance always involves making a change away from sin and towards God. We should think of repentance then as something like a U-turn. You're driving, you're driving, and you know you're going the wrong direction. Guess what? To get hard-headed and, and angry and upset, I'm going this way, I'm going to keep going this way. Urgh. It doesn't get you where you want to go. If you wanted to go to the steakhouse and you're going the wrong direction, you ain't going to eat steak. That's the way it works. You have to be able to take a U-turn. When we're running away from God, in, in God, who knows, maybe it's something you hear on the radio, maybe it's something on the television, maybe it's something a friend says, or maybe you come to church one day, and something you hear makes me think, I am going in the wrong direction. The proper and right thing to do at that point is just turn around. Make a U-turn and say, God, I'm going to stop running away from you because you're good and you love me. That whole cross thing proves that. You care about me. Why would I run away from you? So we take a U-turn. We're going one way. We realize we're wrong, which is a mature thing to do. It's, it's good when people can say, oh, man, the way I just treated my kids was wrong. The thing I just said to my husband, that was way out of line. The way I've been treating my coworkers, that's just not right. It's, it's, it's good when we can say, I, I was wrong, and I want to do better. We turn around. We start heading in the opposite direction. When we're running from God, the right thing to do is to always go in the opposite direction. See, say, if I just say, if I just say, I agree with God that I'm going the wrong way, and then we step on the accelerator a little more, that's actually not repentance. Just saying, yeah, I believe God's good and he has my best interest in mind. And we're heading away from God as fast as we can. That doesn't look like faith because we're really not trusting God with that situation. We keep driving away from God isn't faith. It's a, it's a lack of faith. This is, is really important because I can imagine somebody will say right now, wait, 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 wait. I thought we're saved by grace, not works. In which case, I want to say to you categorically, now please listen, if you think you're saved by faith and not works, uh, you're absolutely right. That's true. We are saved by faith in, this, in the salvific work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. But what is faith? Is it just, uh, there's, uh, there's a test and say, do you believe Jesus is God? Mm, check. Do you believe he died for your sins? Check. Uh, do you believe he'll forgive you? Check. Okay, I'm glad I got that paperwork done because I am out of here. I don't need this church thing. I don't need God. And then whenever the Holy Spirit tries to talk, no, I'm not listening. And we just live our life the way we want. How does that show my life is a life of faith? Jesus said the most important thing is to love God. Do you think God's feeling the love when, we're, when we don't want him? If, if I refuse to turn around, it may be because I, I don't believe. Now, listen, I can be a horrible driver. You can be a horrible driver. I'm trying to turn around. I just, man, and the car's swerving all over the place. We can turn around and, and spin it around, do a 360. Oh, no, I'm going back where I go, but I don't want to go this way, and we do another 360. Because God has reached out to us, and something in our soul says, I want to go his way. I'm a bad driver. I need to learn how to be a better driver. And, and I take a left turn. Oh, good. I take another left turn. Good. Oh, no. I took another left turn. I took another left turn. And pretty soon we're... See, I'm not talking about being a good driver. I'm not talking about always doing the right thing, always living the Christian life. What's the attitude of your heart? I want to do what God has for me because I trust him with my life. I trust him with my future. I trust him with my soul. We can get lost even. But if we put our faith in God and confess that his direction is better and that we want to go where he's directing us, brothers and sisters, God will see you home. He doesn't let go of his children. Even when we're messed up and nasty, he doesn't divorce his kids. 
So I want to ask you, have you taken that step of faith? Have you said, God, your way is way better than my way? And turn that car around. Go where God is directing us. God will see us home. It, it will be okay. It's going to be okay. And we're going to get there because of his grace. But if, but if we put our backs to God, and again, we put that pedal to the floor, it doesn't matter how many times we say, I think God is right. I think God is right. I'm such a sinner. I'm so bad. Thank God for grace. If all we care about is running away from God, that again, that might not be faith. That might be an indication of a lack of faith. Jesus said, turn around, repent. The kingdom of God is here, and you're going to love it. You're going to want to get right with me. And Jesus is calling everybody, everywhere, repent and come to me. Join the, join the kingdom. Be a part of what God is doing. Okay, let's continue now from verse 18. Everybody, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. That Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting the net into the lake. So they're not fishing with a, with a hook and a line. It's hard work. You cast a net in there. You pull it out. Sometimes you catch fish. So oftentimes you don't. You just do it again and do it again. And they were casting the net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once... They left their nets and followed him. And everybody in that church is thinking, yeah, I left my former way of life too. I heard the call and I answered Jesus' call on my life. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, another son of Zebedee. And uh, there in the boat with them was their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called to them and immediately, I like to say that name, that's fun. And immediately they left the boat and their father followed him, them. Uh, they left their boat and their father and followed him. You know, when I was reading that, I thought, I'm going to screw that up, and I screwed it up. So they left their boat and they left their father and they followed Jesus. Uh, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease, sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all those who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, which means a, a region of ten cities, Jerusalem and Judea and the region across the Jordan followed him. So everybody's coming out now to meet Jesus, and maybe you were one of those people. Or maybe you've met people and talked with people uh, who, who followed Christ at this time. In verse 19, we see Christ's very first recorded words to his followers. What does this great man who changed history have to say? What does God incarnate have to say? What does Jesus want you and I to do? He said, come, follow me. Leave what you're doing. Follow me. Follow in my footsteps. And I will make you fishers of men. I want you to think about the impact that had on the people in that first century church hearing this for the very first time. God came, comes down. God comes to save. And when he speaks, the first time speaking to his disciples, the first thing he says is, leave everything and follow me. And let's get more people. Brothers and sisters, you know what Christ wants you to do? Leave the world Leave the lies the devil's selling. Follow Jesus every footstep, step for step. And let's get more people. Jesus says, go out, gather them in, be a fisherman. Fish for people, cast that net. Sometimes you cast it and you get nothing. Sometimes you cast it and a couple people come to Jesus. Sometimes you cast it and the net is breaking with people who want to know Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior. Jesus says, heaven's doors are wide open. Let's go get some people. Let's go get them and bring them in. God comes down. He comes to save. He comes to serve. And he says, leave everything, follow me, and go get some more folks. This is what Jesus is all about. What does Jesus want you to do? Follow him. Do as he did. This is what Jesus is all about. If we're truly followers, this needs to be what we're about as well. And then verse 23, it says, the, king, the gospel of the kingdom. Gospel means glad tidings that God cares. 
glad tidings that God cares, that God is there for people. If there's no God, hope is a bunch of uh, chemicals running through your brain. Same with love. If there's a God, we have reason to hope that death is not the end, that peace is not some illusion. I need to feel good, I need to feel good, I need to feel good. No, say my life right now in a place where I feel bad, but I have hope because I know that there's a heaven. I know that there's a God who loves me and a God who cares. And I don't have to put on this false face. I don't have to pretend to be something I'm not because it's going to be okay. Joy. Forgiveness. I'm so glad that I stand before you today and I'm forgiven and I know Jesus loves me. And I came to Jesus years and years and years ago, about four decades ago. I said, Jesus, please forgive my sin. Come into my life. I want to follow you. I want to be a Christian. And God's never let me, left me or let me down all that time. Jesus is Lord. And wherever Jesus went, he brought love and he brought blessing and he wants us to be the same. That nasty look that we go to work with? No. That nasty look we bring home to our family? No. Everywhere we go, let's bring love. Let's bring blessing. Right now, let's just together as a church, let's pray. Lord God, we come before you and we want to confess, God, your way is better than our way. And Lord, We've blown it in so many ways. We've messed up again and again. And Father, you're good, and we don't want to run away from your goodness anymore. And God, we know that you love us because you died for us on the cross. You gave up everything for, for me. And Lord, I want to say thank you. In your hearts, brothers and sisters, just say thank you to God. God, I want to say thank you for your love, for your grace, for that cross. And now, Lord God, Help me to make that U-turn, and when your Holy Spirit shows me I'm going the wrong way, I don't want to fight you, God. I don't want to fight you anymore. I just want to listen and obey and go your way. So, Father, today I commit myself. Help me to follow you each and every day of my life. Help me to love you. Help me to love my Christian brothers and sisters. And help me to learn how to really be a person of love and blessing with a servant heart, the way you are, the way you revealed yourself to us, Father. God, thank you for our church. Thank you for... Everybody who's here this morning, please bless us, we pray. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.